The famous equation E equals mc squared tells us that the energy of a particle is proportional to its mass. So if we wish to create mass, we could imagine having its energy would allow for this. But it turns out that twice the energy is needed. For what I want to get into, we need a short detour here into perproduction and annihilation. That's because we need to produce not only a particle, but its antiparticle. Electrons have an antimatter particle called the positron, almost identical to each other, but with an opposite charge. What this means is that they act oppositely in electric and magnetic fields. Shown is a cloud chamber. The inside is saturated with water vapour, and if a charged particle moves through it, it will leave a track behind her as water droplets form. What the scientists did was apply a magnetic field, so a moving charged particle would want to move in a circle, the size of which is related to their mass. The purpose of this is that different charges move in different orientations around a circle. For example, a positive charge might go clockwise, whereas a negative charge will go anti-clockwise. What Cody Anderson found was a positive charge in cosmic rays, not unusual as both protons and alpha particles are positively charged. However, he found the mass of the particle to be significantly less than that of a proton. It was at most twice the mass of an electron. This figure from 1932, winning the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1936, shows the positron as the long line through the middle. Today, with better detectors, as well as the ability to create pair production on demand, we have much better figures demonstrating pair production. For example, this one was taken from the Aleph detector at CERN, showing pair production of electron positrons. The reaction that causes an electron positron pair is a photon splitting into an electron and an anti-electron. The energy of the photon has to be enough to create both of the particles. Now into the meat of the video. What the equation E equals mc squared does is relate mass to energy. That is, if we had some mass, and if it was all changed to energy, this is how much energy we should get. For example, if you could turn a kilogram of mass, about one litre of water, into pure energy, how much energy would you get? The speed of light is exactly 299,792,458 metres a second. So, the square of the speed of light is about 9 followed by 16 zeros. As we had 1 kilogram, that means we get 9 followed by 16 zeros joules of energy. These numbers are kind of meaningless without an example. So, let's consider Fat Man, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. It had about 9 trillion joules, about 9 followed by 12 zeros. So, we need 10,000 of them to match 1 litre bottle of water. However, to change a litre of water to energy, you will need a litre of anti-water which is rather hard to find. So you may be wondering what's the point of the equation E equals mc squared. How could we possibly use this concept? To do so, I'm going to have to make a few things clear. Because of the equation, we can talk about mass in terms of energy, or energy in terms of mass. However, when we have a very, very small amount of energy, we need a better unit than a joule. To do this, we're going to have to define a new measure of energy. So, we define an electron volt to be the energy an electron gets when it is accelerated through one volt of potential difference. This is a very useful unit as it's about the energy scale of the mass of particles. A mega electron volt is a million electron volts. So let's now look at the mass of some particles. The mass of an electron is 0.51 mega electron volts. The mass of a proton, 938.3 mega electron volts. A neutron has mass 939.6 mega electron volts. And the deuterium nucleus has a mass of 1875.8 mega electron volts. Now a deuterium is made up of a proton and a neutron that have been bound together. So if we add the mass of a proton to the mass of a neutron, we find that the total mass is 1877.9 mega electron volts. However, the mass of a deuterium, like I just said, it's 1875.8. Why is deuterium lighter? 2.1 mega electron volts is quite a substantial amount. Like I said, an electron has mass 0.511 mega electron volts. The reason deuterium is lighter than the sum of its parts is that when a neutron and proton bind together to form a deuterium, it loses some mass. But what do I mean by loss of mass? Remember that mass and energy are equivalent. So what I'm actually saying is a loss of energy. And so we introduce the concept of binding energy that the bound system can have a different energy than the sum of its component parts due to the interaction of the parts. For example, if you push together two of the same poles on a magnet, or if you push together opposite poles, the energy is different. If a system had a state of lower energy, once in that state, 
energy would need to be added in order to put it back into its original state. But as the system goes into a lower state, by conservation of energy, the difference of energy has to come from somewhere. So the mass decreases in order to compensate, again by E equals mc squared. In order to separate the system back to its component parts, the same amount of energy would need to be put back into the system. This process is the basis of how nuclear fusion and fission both work. Fusion is when we push together atoms, protons and neutrons for example, forming a new atom. Like we have just shown, a proton and a neutron binding together to form a deuterium. We could also fuse the deuterium nuclei together to form a helium nuclei, each releasing energy when the particles get fused. However, as we fuse more and more particles together, the amount of energy released decreases. However, the binding energy is still increasing, up to a point. Once past this point, the binding energy decreases. Once the binding energy for lighter elements becomes higher than that for heavy. If we separate the heavy elements, we get energy released, as the system is now going to a state of higher binding energy. This is the process of nuclear fission. Note that both of these processes can happen at any binding energy, except you only get energy released when you go into a higher binding energy. For an example of a fission reaction, uranium-238 fissions into an alpha particle and thorium-234. By a similar concept, if we look back at the mass difference between a proton and a neutron, a neutron has more energy than a proton, it has a higher mass. So, neutrons are able to decay into a proton. This is via the reaction of a neutron changing into a proton, an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. This is a process of a decay of a free neutron, that is when the neutron isn't caught up in an atom. Neutrons have a half-life of about 15 minutes. That is, given a very large number of neutrons, after 15 minutes you expect half of them to be gone. If you have a single neutron, after 15 minutes there is a 50% chance for it to have changed into a proton. More accurately, the wave function of the neutron has changed into a superposition of both, each with probability a half. That's it for part 1. In part 2 we will show how this explains nuclear synthesis.